Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing fantastic. So, I want to talk to you today about uniforms. So, as you saw in my community posts, I posted about, you know, different religious garbs and how most of us are aware that people always frame the Islamic clothing as oppressive. And as an American revert, it's getting quite annoying having my fellow Americans say I'm oppressed because I choose to not dress like Cardi B. And it's starting to really frustrate me how I can literally tell someone I am not oppressed and they just keep telling me that I am. It is quite bizarre. So I started thinking about clothing contracts and how ex-Muslims, those retards, and different Christians who are not as really awesome as Orthodox Christians, but are more liberal, and certain atheists and occultists and such, you know, the usuals, and the nasty feminists, how they ignore clothing contracts all around them. So I just started thinking about when I was working in the restaurant industry, when you go to apply for a job, they tell you the uniform. For one job it was blue jeans, and they had to be a certain shade of blue, black shoes, and you had to have your hair tied back in a double pony, meaning two hair ties on the top and bottom. And you had to have a freshly pressed white button-up shirt, you know, the collared ones. And for other jobs, it was you had to have your hair in a bun or a braid, no nail polish, no perfume, and you had to wear their uniform. They would give you a custom shirt. And then you could wear whatever color pants you want. Other jobs, it was black pants. There was all different jobs I had that had a strict uniform. And if you did not show up in the full uniform, they would send you home. And if a girl didn't come to work with her hair the proper way, they'd send you home. And if you got sent home two times, you're fired. Right? And certain office jobs, they would tell you, okay, you have to dress this corporate casual. You can't have a midriff. You can't dress like this right and even further when you are for example let's put it this way when you're a stripper you have a dress code you're not there to dress like Hillary Clinton in a pantsuit you're there to dress like you're selling something because you are and the more revealing and the more intricate you get with your costumes you know that's how you're gonna dress and that's the rules of the game you're gonna dress that way you're gonna work that club that's what you had to do and you don't get to go in there. Now, if it's part of an act, you go on stage and you have some cop outfit or whatever, that is quite different. But you can't stand on stage and then not take anything off. The uniform is a G-string. Some allow you to go full nude, others don't. But that's the uniform is nudity. It's exposing yourself. And that's not to, to them, that's not oppression. When the person who owns the strip club, the managers... They tell you, you will take off your clothes. Okay? That's what this job entails. It's a voluntary economic contract. You will do it or you don't get the job. And that is force for the thing you voluntarily signed up for. Now, if you're a CEO, you're expected... Right, let's just say you're, you're working in a financial district in San Francisco. You're the CEO of some company. Suit polished shoes, looking good. You have to look good. You can't go in there looking like a bum. Now, sure, I've seen Jack Dorsey look like a complete psychopath. He's disheveled. That's kind of rare, but they expect you to look a certain way. If you go into Wells Fargo, let's say I go into Wells Fargo and I have no shirt on, no bra, no shoes, and I walk in and demand service. They're going to get the security guard and throw me out, right? Because there's a dress code for entering an establishment that society and the private corporation has decided for their place. Even gas stations will say, no shoes, no shirt, no service, right? We have the right to refuse service to anyone. That is what you see in so many businesses. A kid cannot wear, unfortunately, a pro-Second Amendment shirt to high school in many places, especially a liberal place, 
They will call your parents and say, your son has to change his shirt. He's not allowed to wear it. Even if you have a shirt that says F Joe Biden, they'll tell the kid, sorry, you can't wear a shirt with explicitives. Got to go home. Even some people who wore pro Trump shirts were told you can't wear that. Right? Some schools, if you look at their criterion, they have dress codes. Other schools, I've unfortunately seen some high schools where girls can have their midriff exposed, their cleavage exposed. But when I was growing up in different schools around the Mormons, they had a hall patrol lady who would make sure you weren't, you know, showing your belly button and, you know, wearing a spaghetti strap shirt, right? You had to have your shoulders covered. They liked modesty. When I went to school in Philly, the uniform was tan pants, burgundy polo shirt. That's the uniform. You don't come to school in the uniform, you're going home. That is an, a, a voluntary agreement that you agree with with the dress code. Okay? A priest, technically, when he's not at the cathedral doing what he's got to do, he can wear whatever he wants. But when he's on the job, he's expected to dress a certain way because how he dresses reflects his position. A police officer on duty must wear his uniform. He is required. He has signed an agreement. You will wear your badge. You will show your badge. You will have all the things on your belt right that you need. This is what you need. I even had jobs that required to have certain type of shoes that were non-slip because if you slip at work, you can get workman's comp, and if you didn't have those right kind of shoes, and you went to get your, your bills paid by the, your work for the hospital, they could contest it in court. So it was smart of them to require me to get those good shoes because it helps me, it helps them. No one wants to fall at work. And so this was required, okay? Other jobs require you to cover your tattoos. Others don't. It is a voluntary economic contract, a cultural dress code that you have to obey by. Sure, in certain coffee shops in San Francisco, you have chicks with their vaginas hanging out. They have really nasty hair that looks like they haven't showered in a week. They stink. They got hairy armpits. Yeah, some of those places in Portland, Oregon and others where it's very far left, you can do whatever you want and look as nasty and dirty as you want. But in most professional establishments, a certain way of behaving and a dress code is enforced. Okay? Even certain cooks had to wear a hairnet. Okay? And then when the koofy came, you had to wear a face mask. So a hairnet, face masks, your apron, your special shoes. Okay? Clean, pressed, chef shirt. There was rules. And if you didn't have, like, some even required at least two pins. Right? There was so many rules. And if you violated one of those, you would be sent home. No bright nail polish. No bright makeup. Some jobs wouldn't even hire you if you had like pink or blue hair, which is awesome because it keeps a lot of the wackos out. So when people criticize Islamic clothing as it's about force, ugh, it's like you do realize religion is voluntary, right? You do realize you don't have to be a Muslim, right? And I'm sorry, a hijab is the basic component of the faith. Are you really a believer if you won't cover your hair? Are you such a slave to hedonism and the male gaze that you cannot control your desires to be stared at by dudes? Are you really that weak? How have you not broken free of your feminist Western brainwashing and then being a Muslim? How can you feel like a real Muslim when you don't cover your hair? That is the basic thing. It's like a Christian not wearing a cross. Imagine a Christian saying, I refuse to wear the cross, right? And there are certain denominations that where the women traditionally wear it. They'd be like, what? It's like a Jew not wearing that tiny little hat, right? They'd be like, what do you, what do you, what? You, you don't get to decide the traditions. The traditions are the traditions. The codes are the codes. You obey it or leave, right? And before you say, oh, but, uh, but uh, apostate would get hurt, oh, Okay, that's not happening on a large scale anymore in the world. And it's problem solved, just leave. You can't be a coward. You can't be a coward in your life. I'm so tired of hearing these people say, Oh my gosh, 
If I say I'm not a Muslim in this country, I'll be this, I'll be executed. Okay, well, guess what? You either live like a coward or you end up living on your feet. You got to stand up for what you believe in, okay? You got to do what you got to do. It was so easy for you to say, well, listen, there's a lot of gangs in America. There's a lot of meth heads running around stabbing people. There's drunk drivers. There's pimps shooting each other for bad drug deals. There's violence everywhere in America, so don't give me this crap. And if you don't believe me, just look at crime statistics of California, okay? Why don't you take some stats on Oakland and Richmond and different East L.A. hoods and then tell me about how, how privileged I am to be around that, all right? So spare me. If you're going to live in California, you're going to live in Chicago, you're going to live in New York, you're around a level of violence. All right? And if you don't like it, move. Or make it better. But no one forced you to be Muslim. And don't tell me, yeah, but they grew up as Muslim and, and if they say anything, their parents will abandon them. Man, there's orphans that whine less, okay? There's orphans that whine less. There's people who have crappy abusive parents and they're not religious. There's people who have good parents who are religious. So get over yourself. If you can't, you know, take some lessons and say, well, look at Abraham. He had to deal with his father being an idol worshiper. You know, there's so many examples in life where people had to stand up to their own parents and just take the L. Just take the L. You can't expect anything from certain people. And as someone who came from a completely broken family... Trust me, I know what I'm saying, and, I, and I, I, I live by it, okay? I know what it's like to not have any parents where you're just like, are they really my parents? I guess I'm just gonna, I just do what I gotta do. And if they go, they go. Because some people are blessed with a good mom and dad, and others are not. So, if you're not, you just gotta deal with it, okay? And it hurts for a while, but eventually you get over it, and you have to get over it. So if you leave Islam and your family don't want to talk to you anymore, guess what? There's plenty of parents who hate their kids and their kids hate their parents for millions of other reasons. Okay? So, stop. Okay? Just stop. And for example, when you join Islam, there is a cultural, spiritual contract of a dress code. Okay? You don't get to go into a thousand-year-old religion, right? Some argue Adam was the first Muslim, Abraham... Because they all called them monotheism. We can discuss that another time. But the point is, when the hijab was legislated is my point. And Christians used to be very modest, right? Even Orthodox Jews, very modest. It's just the modern liberals and occultists who have eroded religious values. Because they want to sell products that work on the insecurity of women. Get them to get plastic surgery. Get them into the brothel culture. Get them to spend money on their hair. On fake eyelashes. Things that really waste their money and time and make them go insane with how they look and create a very strong narcissistic persona in women, okay? That's stuck to vanity and vapidity. So there's that, that dark philosophy. But if you become a Muslim and you say, La ilaha illallah, shahadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and then you're going to argue about a hijab, it's like, why did you even convert them? Because... When you really have Iman, when you really are upon the deen, when you really are connected to Allah, when you really fear Allah, when you actually fear Allah, and you want to be like the mothers of the believers, okay? Even the Mother Mary of Jesus in Catholicism, <laughs> how she's portrayed. You're like, if you want to ha be modest, you got to let go of the hedonism. You don't get to have it both ways. That's why it's shocking when you see, when, well, when I saw... Uh, Instagram Muslim chick just full face of makeup no hijab and she has a sweater that says make it halal and it's like the irony the irony and then there's good hijabi sisters and nakabi sisters with way less subs and it just blows my mind like the open person who openly defies Allah gets the most attention and that's how you know shaitan is real that's how you know that the one who's the biggest hypocrite it shows because the littlest thing, the hijab for the woman is the littlest thing. It's so simple, but they feel insecure. Why? Because they want to show their beauty. They want to be sexy. They want to be hot. They want to be chased after. They want to be lust for. They want to turn people on. And that's the truth. 
Okay, when I used to dress provocative, I didn't do it for myself. Not self-love, self-help. No, you do it to make ugly women feel bad and to make pretty women feel like you're a threat to them, their territory, and to make men look at you and so you can get dopamines and self-esteem. That is the truth and every woman knows it. So how are you going to be spiritual in a pure sense if you dress like an occultist? If you're just revealing your body all the time, constantly getting men horny, constantly showing your body to married men, constantly showing your breasts to old dudes and children and dogs, right? And turning on lesbians and bisexuals and, and keeping the sex energy in the air. How is that spiritual? It isn't. It is not. It is not for Islam. Islam does not value that kind of sexual energy. Now, when you're home, use that pent-up energy, right, with your mate. Have very good intimacy with your mate. Have all the costumes and all the shoes and and fun things you want to do. These, you know, flavored oils, whatever you want to do with your mate. It's for your mate. Okay, you want to put beads in your hair. You want to wear a wig. Whatever it is you want to do, share with your mate. But in the outside street, the true test of your faith, of you fearing Allah, believing in the last day, is by you covering the basics of your hair. Now, it's true sometimes, you know, I see hair, I don't get tempted by it or, you know, think anything of it. It takes time to kind of get over that, I understand. But when you say your shahada as a revert, okay, you have to make the change. It's like someone gets baptized, they don't get to keep selling crack. Someone gets baptized, they don't get to keep staying on the stripper pole. You have taken a sacred vow that means you have responsibility. You are accountable for your oath. Otherwise, don't take the oath. Hello, no one forces you to be a Muslim. No one's forcing you to stay. And if you openly disobey the hijab rules, you are defiantly disobedient, you're a bad example, and you should be shunned, and you should be educated. And if you don't want to do it, don't pretend you're some feminist freedom fighter. Because you're not. You're not. You're spreading corruption. You're actually helping the occultists, the secular liberal atheists, to push more girls into OnlyFans, to make more women insane and solely focus on their beauty. The, this age, the girls are so obsessed with their body that they're almost stuck in a prison of their own making because of it, where they can't stop taking selfies, they can't stop wanting to put filters, plastic surgery, they're going nuts. They can't handle anyone saying to them, you're not pretty, I'm not attracted to you. It's all these girls excessively obsessing over beauty instead of character, personality, community, dean. It's distracting. And women not wanting to age and clinging for every new cream and every new facelift and every new lip injection and a nose job. They gotta make me look young, make me look hot. Ah! They go nuts because they don't want to age and they don't want to not be a sex object. It's insane to me. And so... When people complain and call the Muslim hijab, the niqab, the burqa, you name it, whatever the woman feels comfortable with and what her culture has pushed on her in a sense of, okay, we're, we, we accept this, we don't accept that, whatever it is, that is a contract that you've made after taking your sacred vow. When you made your sacred vow, you agreed to follow the rules and it's upon you to look for the rules and do your best to adapt and slowly grow to that but the hijab is like level one level one okay and if you don't want to put the hijab it is because you want to be sexy you want to turn people on which shows you don't have the spiritual figure yet so you should not be promoted to muslim girls because if you don't cover your hair your basic hair you have no clout no standing to lecture anything to any Muslim girl, okay, or Muslim men, because you're breaking all the rules, okay? You have to do better, 
all right? And if you've took, taken your holy oath and you still go back and forth with a hijab like it's like a fashion statement, what have you done? Or these girls who wear the scarf and like, oh, here is exposed? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? We can see what you're doing. Stop it, right? That's why I have mad respect for the sisters who openly just accept their role. Every day they push to learn more about Islam. It's amazing. They're such great role models. We should look to them. But again, the Islamic clothing is a voluntary contract that came from your sacred oath. Okay? So it's not oppression. You agree to it. And if you don't agree to it, grow a spine and leave the religion. No, and, and, if, and if you get punished for it, don't be a coward. I, when I go to certain dangerous neighborhoods, I could get shot really easily as a bystander. That's what happens in life. You just got to keep on keeping on. No living in fear. Okay? So many You can die from so many things in this world. You just got to keep on keeping on. It's ridiculous to me. Let me know what you think.